For the past year or so, there have been a ton of flash NAS devices that have come onto the market. And I can honestly say that I've never been one to understand them. When I think of a NAS, I think of a lot of storage. And in the short term, nothing will compete with three and a half inch hard drives if a lot of storage is required. When I think of a NAS where speed is important, I think of regular old two and a half inch SSDs that connect through SATA. So I've never been one to find a need for a flash NAS, even if speed is important. So when TerraMaster reached out asking if I wanted to test their new F8 SSD Plus, I said yes because I needed to see what I was missing. Now my issue with these devices generally comes down to maximum performance because they're super low power, quiet, and NVMe SSDs have come down a lot in price. So while they're still more expensive than a two and a half inch SSD, they're not nearly as expensive as they always were. So right off the bat, those are huge wins for this device. The problem is the maximum performance the device is capable of is based on PCIe lanes. And the way the PCIe lanes are utilized will ultimately determine how fast this will perform as a NAS. Now this is going to be fairly technical, but it's important to explain how all of this works because it will impact every flash NAS device you look at in the future, so please do not skip over this. Each NVMe SSD that's installed in a device like this utilizes PCIe lanes. This allows them to function extremely fast from a read-write perspective, but every processor and motherboard chipset has a maximum number of PCIe lanes that it supports, and those PCIe lanes can be utilized differently. This means that from device to device, you can see wildly different performance based on the CPU and motherboard being used even if you're using the exact same SSD that you've used on a different device. The reason the performance can be impacted is because PCIe lanes can be downgraded. Using PCIe Gen 3 as an example, at maximum speed, most consumer NVMe SSDs will run at Gen 3 by four, which would provide a maximum throughput of roughly four gigabytes per second for each device, if it's allotted for PCIe lanes. The device can be downgraded though, and in a downgraded state, each PCIe lane allotted to a Gen 3 NVMe SSD will utilize roughly one gigabyte per second of throughput. So Gen 3 by one would be one gigabyte per second, Gen 3 by two would be two gigabytes per second, and so on. So if you were using Gen 3 by four NVMe SSDs in a flash NAS that supported let's say eight PCIe lanes, the manufacturer can decide to utilize two PCIe lanes for four total NVMe SSDs, meaning they'll all be downgraded to Gen 3 by two speeds, or one PCIe lane for eight total NVMe SSDs that are all downgraded to Gen 3 by one. Using this example, for the most part, they'll function the same from a speed perspective, it's just that the PCIe lanes are being utilized differently. So to me, the biggest thing for an all-flash NAS device is the total number of PCIe lanes that it has available, because it will ultimately determine how fast the actual NAS device can run. Now, looking at the F8 SSD+, Plus, there are eight total NVMe slots. Since the processor used is the Intel i3 N305, we can see that it supports a maximum of nine total PCIe lanes, so TerraMaster reserved eight for the NVMe drives and one for the 10 gigabit port. This means that all NVMe SSDs are capped at Gen 3 by one speeds, which means that each NVMe is capable of handling roughly one gigabyte per second of throughput which will max out the 10 gigabit connection on the device. That's the most important part, but it also means that each drive will only perform at 25% of its maximum speed. Now, TerraMaster isn't hiding behind this because they have directly on their marketing material for this device that it supports one gigabyte per second of read and write speeds. The problem is it opens the door for discussions like this because I don't think the average consumer will understand anything about PCIe lanes. So whatever the SSD is marketed as in terms of performance is what a user will think they're getting, and they'll be getting roughly 25% of that per drive. This is also one of the biggest downsides to buying flash NAS devices as a consumer, because you might be enticed to buy that fancy Gen 5 NVMe SSD for that improved performance without realizing that you're basically throwing money out the window because the NAS doesn't support it. To me, there needs to be a lot of education on this topic, an education that right now doesn't exist for the average consumer when they're comparing products in this specific category. Now back to how all of that plays into this device. It's not all bad because as mentioned, an NVMe SSD running at Gen 3 by one speeds should come close to saturating the 10 gigabit connection by itself. 
but keep in mind we'll be utilizing RAID, so it'll be a lot higher than that. Now in terms of PCIe lanes on a flash NAS, more is better, but we have to keep price to performance in mind, and $799.99 for this type of performance isn't that bad, especially when looking at other options in this category. We also still haven't answered the question on if I changed my mind on all flash NAS devices, but we'll get to that. To get specs out of the way, it comes with an Intel i3 and 305 processor, 16 gigabytes of DDR5 non-ECC memory that can be upgraded to 32 gigabytes, three USB 3.2 ports, and an HDMI port, which we will get to. When I got the device, I loaded it up with eight Western Digital SN700 250 gigabyte NVMe SSDs that Western Digital provided in partnership with Terramaster. I configured a RAID 6 array since all of the drives were the same size, but if you have mixed size drives, you can use Terramaster's T-RAID option. After setting up the device, we were brought to TOS 6, which is the latest operating system from Terramaster. I've used TOS 4, 5, and now 6, and they have each gotten better, but I don't have the longevity with this operating system that I have with TOS 5, so speaking on its long-term reliability isn't something that I can do. With that said, at this point in time, there's a lot to like with this operating system, and then there's still some of the old TOS problems that still exist. The layout has changed and it's easy to navigate. It's fast in just about every way, from the operating system to transfer speeds over 10 gigabit, and TerraMaster did something with the applications on this operating system that I can honestly say is one of the most amazing things I've seen out of a NAS operating system. When you launch their backup tool, they bring you to a topology diagram of all of their apps and exactly how they work. After seeing this, I don't understand why other manufacturers haven't done this. For new users, this is incredible because there's so much time spent trying to figure out what each application does that laying it out visually like this just makes sense and it's something that you can always reference. A lot of these applications seem to work pretty well outside of a few random GUI issues where I found that refreshes of TOS are required. Overall, you can tell that TerraMaster spent a lot of time trying to focus on the user experience, especially around these apps. Where things get a little messy is with some of their other applications. One of the biggest reasons you might want an all-flash NAS could be for virtualization, and they do offer a VirtualBox application in their app store, but it is so old that you basically can't use it. As soon as you install your operating system by booting to the floppy disk, come on. As soon as you configure the virtual machine and installation media, you would naturally go into the console to configure the OS. But the console requires Adobe Flash, which Adobe ended support for in 2020. I've said this in TOS reviews in the past, but having this in the operating system discredits all of the other good things that they're doing here, and it needs to be removed. It's not a benefit to say we support virtualization and then produce a solution that doesn't work. In fact, it's worse than if it simply wasn't there, and I still cannot figure out why it hasn't been removed. So out of the box, this device does not support virtualization outside of having an application that technically does virtualization, which doesn't work with modern browsers. Then there's Docker, which I couldn't get to work initially until I rebooted the NAS device. It has a familiar look and seems to work as you'd expect. The big takeaway here is that the operating system has bugs, and you're going to notice them as you navigate TOS. But if you know where to refresh and when to reboot, you should be able to get things to work properly. I wouldn't say it's the most polished operating system, but it's the first release for TOS 6, and it's come a long way since I started with TOS 4. The final thing to say on this operating system is that as an actual NAS, meaning storing data, backing that data up, potentially syncing that data with one of their client applications, and configuring snapshots, it's pretty solid outside of a few of the bugs discussed. And at the end of the day, this is the most important part for any NAS operating system. I'm afraid to say anything more than that because the truth is, reliability for NAS devices isn't something that I feel should be commented on after a few weeks of usage. But in this limited time frame, I'm pretty optimistic. Now that HDMI port is going to potentially come in handy for you because you can install TrueNAS or Unraid on this device if you have any operating system concerns. And if you don't know anything about them, I'll leave a link in the description for a video I did comparing DIY NAS operating systems. The problem is you will still be limited by the hardware and those PCIe lanes can't change. So the drive performance that we spoke of earlier will be the same on any OS. You might just prefer one option over the other, which then leads us to my overall thoughts on the device. 
I probably sounded pessimistic at times, but I do think that this is a pretty good little device. And it's made me a lot more optimistic about the future of flash NAS devices. I'm not in love with the speed limitations on each drive. I wish it had a second 10 gigabit NIC, but everything comes at a cost and more PCIe lanes with better hardware would jack up the price and most likely put it out of reach for the majority of people. So I think that TerraMaster did the best they could given the constraints that a device like this has from a consumer market perspective. TOS 6 has gotten better and it's not crazy to say that TOS 6 is now a mainstream option comparable to brands like QNAP, Asus Store, and Ugreen. Note that I left Synology off that list because quite frankly, this device blows Synology out of the water from a hardware perspective, even with some of its limitations. For that reason, I don't think people shopping for a NAS device like this have Synology on their radar. But from a NAS operating system perspective, DSM is still in that next tier up, though the gap is getting smaller and smaller, which is good for consumers. It's also made me realize that we're probably five to 10 years out from a flash NAS device being fully mainstream. And I was probably being short-sighted by thinking that these devices don't have their place. There's something to say about a NAS device that's super low powered, quiet but fast, that supports 10 gigabit speeds and can fit on a desktop next to you without having to hear hard drives clanging around all the time. There will most likely always be a spot for three and a half inch hard drives in NAS devices especially for huge amounts of data. But the majority of NAS owners aren't storing tens of terabytes of data. So a flash NAS device like this might actually be perfect. From that angle, these types of devices are probably the future. And for a first iteration from TerraMaster, this thing isn't that bad. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time.